And I, and I love the stories, and I think that, you know, you, you smile and you laugh and you think about how important stories are. We were at a meeting last week, and someone put up a, a picture on the, on the screen, and it was, a, it was a man on an elephant. And, and, and the, the, the message to the story was this, how do you get an elephant to move? Um, you know, and so the rider is really represents someone who we want to change. We want to change the thought process. We want them to do something differently. The destination is really the data. The destination is what it is you know, that we are trying to make them change based on. But the elephant is the story. And the story is what really drives change. You know, I can show a doctor data all day long. And, and is that going to make them change what they do? Probably not. Um, you know, I mean, it, it, you, can, you can do a little public shaming. And we can show them that you know, you're the bottom provider in the, in, the, in the clinic for colon cancer screening. Or you're the worst in you know, immunizations. But in the heat of the day, when they're trying to get through 30 patients in a clinic, how important is that stuff to them? But the stories matter. And the stories really change what you want to do and how you want to do it. So, so um, we started this whole process um, back with CPCI. And Patricia in the back and I sat and we filled out applications until 11.30 the night before the deadline to get our clinics enrolled. We had no clue what we were doing. And we didn't know what kind of a journey we were going to be on when we did that. Part of that process was because we knew we needed to do something different. We knew we needed to change the, the culture of our clinics and the way we, we thought about our patients. Um, one of the frustrations we had, though, once we started CPC, was we kept waiting for people to tell us what to do. Um, you know, come on, CMS. You know, we don't understand what risk stratification is. You need to tell us what risk stratification is. We don't know what a care coordinator is supposed to do. Show us, have someone come in and show us what they're supposed to do. What we ultimately understood over time was that going through the process is really, really important. And so for all of you who are starting, you know, the first year of your transition into this or second year, trying to understand, you know, what is it that I need to be doing? Um, no one can tell you. We can't tell you exactly what you need to do, but we can give you some tools and we can help you understand. We're still learning and, and you know, I, I, would, I would not want anyone to walk through this, this um, presentation thinking that we have the answers because I can tell you no one has the answers. We've talked to people on the East Coast, on the West Coast. Everyone is navigating these waters differently and, and it depends on what your goals are. <clears throat> but what I do want to talk about is a paradigm shift. And, and the paradigm shift is really about um, what, what is um, team-based care? Um, because we still have this concept, and I can tell you, we have fought this battle for the last six years, the captain of the ship concept. You know, the doctor is in the clinic, and we all kind of let the doctor run the show. And, and the paradigm shift that we're really moving away from is taking population health out of the doctor's hands and putting it in the care coordinator's hands or the care manager's hands. Ultimately, we think about burnout and, you know, and, and how in primary care, we hear a lot of stories about doctors being unhappy. Well, you know, I, I, I'm not very sympathetic in, in the sense that, you know, this is what I do because I love to do it. And you can pay me half as much and I would still do what I'm doing. But, but I am sympathetic to the concept of Mark's story that, you know, his grandfather went out, he took his horse out, he fixed a broken leg, he went home. He didn't have to deal with databases. He didn't have to think about which one of my patients didn't get a pneumovax and, and, and the, the, the hundred other guidelines that direct our care that we deal with now. The electronic medical records, we complain about those because we see that as a barrier to providing care, but ultimately electronic medical records help us provide better care. So how do we make that transition? Well, I think that what we want to talk about today and what I want to talk about in the next 20 minutes is, is how you think about your role as a care coordinator, as a care manager. And I don't want anyone in this room to walk out here thinking that it is a subservient role to the physician or to the, to the APPs. We want you to think about yourselves as leaders and people who truly um, control population health in your practices and in your, in your organizations. Um, and if you walk away with that concept um, and that empowerment, I think then you can talk about how do I now provide value to the provider and then help manage that population of patients that we're taking care of. And so, so I, I, I titled this appropriately. They need to be, they need to understand, you know, that, that they're on your team. And I think when that, when that is uh, the way you view this, I think that you'll be more effective in what you do. So um, th this, is, <laughs> this is the first cartoon, I don't know if you can see that, but 
uh, the failure of the project can only be blamed on, and then you have someone whose pager goes off and walks out in the middle of the conversation. We blame it on that guy. Well, <laughs> I can tell you, um, we all pass blame around, but, but, but it's the unengaged provider that we really want to be targeting and we want to demonstrate how we show them value. Um, and and I, I think this, this is really truly, when we talk to our care coordinators, and I look back when we began, we had the burnout posture in our practices. We had that provider who crossed his arms and, and said, I'm not going to do that. And you know, why are you in the middle of my patients? And why are you giving me these list of patients to deal, this, deal with? Um, and that, that posture has changed in our organization, not across all practices, but I can tell you um, it's changed dramatically for most practices. And, and in moving to this concept of the team-based model, we're all rolling in the same direction. If you look at that boat, you know, who's the doctor in there? I would tell you it's not necessarily that person sitting in the front. Um, it may be the person sitting in the middle, it may be the person sitting in the back. But I think if you understand that idea, I think that's really important. The, the other uh, thing that we think, think about is, you know, how, how do you approach people in practices? I do think you need to kind of lump them into categories because Mark and I are those people on the very far side that, you know, what we would consider the innovators. Maybe, maybe we're just a little more malleable. Maybe more, we're open to. Um, that mic, just picking it up. Yeah, they can't hear you in the back very well. Sorry. Sorry. Um, I, I, I think I speak loudly, but apparently not. <laughs> so, 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 you know, the innovators are the easy ones. So when you're thinking about that population of providers that you're dealing with in your practice, and, and when I say providers, I really truly really mean the whole office. You're going to have medical assistants who have been there for 20 years, right? They, they are on top of their game. You are not going to get in the middle of their practice. It's no different than that, or physicians, or you know, uh, other people in the clinic. So, so we kind of have to think a little bit about, you know, the early adopters are the easy ones. Don't even bother them. They'll find the value of what you do. You know, the late adopters, the laggards, those are the ones who, you know, eventually they'll come around because they, everyone else has. Well, you know, it, they, they'll hold out for as long as they can. And, and, and once they realize that it's just pointless, um, you know, they just, they, they find a way. The people you really want to focus on are really the, the early majority and the late majority people. The ones that, that's the big population of our doctors that they're, they're, they're putting their toe in the water, but they're not sure if they want to swim or not. Um, and, and I think for us, um, you know, we can tell you person by person where they fall in this by their responses. But I think it's important to understand this because, because you want to take those innovators and the early adopters and you want to use them as, as, as your tools to, to help move the other group of, of, of providers. So, so engage them and then use them to, to say, hey, go talk to so-and-so. Or, you know, I, 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 we had a really great success with this one. You know, can we share that at one of our clinic meetings? You know, I mean, really engage them and utilize them as resources for the, for the, for the last batch of people. We talked about this a lot as, as we um, began the process. What, what does it take to change in an organization? And there's some really great models out there um, that describe the, 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 all the pieces, the components to help people change. And that concept of change management is, is, is all through every industry in the company, in, in the country. So whether you're adopting you know, uh, technology or whether you're um, uh, changing the process in, in, a, uh, in a business, um, you know, that, that whole concept of change management applies to anything. And it darn sure applies to what we do. And so this, this idea of, of change models, I think it's important to know about this. And we spent some time, we read some books when we began, uh, you know, how do you, how do you kind of create excitement around something? There's all kinds of tools that you can use and, and, and methods that you can use. And these might be posters at a clinic, you know, um, you know, singing the, the, the story about something that you've done. Um, you know, there, there's, there's really formal structures around this. How do you communicate information? We have now newsletters. We have quality newsletter. We have, we have uh, you know, uh, general newsletters. We, we share stories about things. We put data up. You know, how do you continue that momentum? And, and as politicians will tell you, those kind of stories change people's minds. If they hear the message over and over and over about, Boy, look at how good we're doing on hypertension. And now the next story is, look at how we're doing, how we moved um, you know, breast cancer treating. And now the next story is, look at how we're doing on our immunizations. That eventually changes minds. And people, people follow those stories and, and begin to understand, hey, this is really what's happening. 
whether I like it or not, um, it, it's changing, and I, I'm going to guess I'm going to get on board with it. But, but, uh, and I'm not going to go through and read everything on the slide, but, but you'll have that information. Um, think about those processes when you are struggling in a practice or struggling in a location. What do I need to do to conceptually change the way people think about something? And Cotter was the one that we really spent a lot of time in. Uh, John Cotter's got a great book on, on change management, and, and the book takes about you know, four hours to read, so it's not a huge book. But, but it really talks about the different steps you move through. And it's, these are real steps, you know, beginning to end um, that help. And you, can, you might move through this cycle three or four times in the organization. But, but I think um, thinking about these conceptually really helped us a lot as we started uh, thinking about um, what we want to do in our clinics. So how do we create value? Everyone's familiar with this, right? Um, in our practice, um, five years ago, if we talked about the triple A, people looked at us like, what are you talking about? Is it an ice cream flavor? What is that? So, so, but now people understand what the triple A is, and we talk about it over and over and over again. So, so it goes back to that that idea of you know cost and quality and patient satisfaction. Um, and, and I think you all need to think about that as you're thinking about how you engage your practices and the people you work with. Um, when we think about value, um, I, I think about a bunch of different things, but, but, but I think in organizations, the concept of burnout is really um, defined, in my mind, real simply. It's high stress, low control. So, so if I'm in a situation where I have lots of stress and I have very little control over that stress, that's going to drive burnout. That's going to drive dissatisfaction. That's going to drive people to, to uh, kind of clam up and not participate, not engage. We don't want that situation. So how do we lower the stress level and how do we increase the control that they have? I think population health is the perfect tool for that. I think that's the ideal way to, to begin to engage people. Then you take the stress, you, you take the, that burnout concept, you lower it, um, and then you turn around and you, you, you show the value that people get and that, that creates engagement for those providers. So even some of the most resistant providers we have now, if we lose a care coordinator in a practice for one reason or another, the first thing we hear from those providers is when are you going to replace that person? Because they see that value. They, they see the value of lowering the stress and, and, and helping offset some of that work that they were doing. Um, we know that quality metrics um, you know, are, can definitely be in, impacted by what you all do. We have providers in our group now who have gotten awards from some more health plans because of their improvement in, in screening or the improvement in some of their quality metrics. Those providers did absolutely nothing different in their practice. Guess who did the work? The care coordinators. Um, the care coordinators were the ones who were calling, that were making, they were getting people in. The providers, we, they, they loved the pat on the back, they loved it, but they kind of scratch their heads and go, hmm, that's interesting. But, but they're, they're seeing value, and, and that recognition really matters. Patient satisfaction, we know that what we do impacts satisfaction. It may not impact it um, across the whole organization, but those people that are struggling or the, are, are the, most, um, the most frustrated with the healthcare system are the ones that we can have the biggest impact on. And we know that patient satisfaction is important uh, because to some degree it dictates how we get paid. In our organization, we have patient satisfaction as one of the compensation metrics. Providers are, are, are penalized if they're on the bottom quartile of patient satisfaction across the group. We know it helps access, and, and I would challenge that at some point in time, as primary care doctor, you know, we, we're going to have no option. Um, I'm going to have to provide access to patients a different way than I do right now. Um, seeing me for every visit makes no sense. And so we begin to really move that transition away to, to um, coming in every six months, to, every, 12, every 12 months to see me, and maybe coming in to see a care coordinator doing some lab work and some basic things um, in, in the clinic on, on, on the alternate visits. Um, I just don't have enough room in my practice to see the patients who need to get in. And I think your practices would be almost exactly the same. Um, it's, not, it's not that it changes my income. My income's not gonna change one way or another. I just have the ability to provide better access to my patients. Um, we know about cost and that transition, um, you know, and, and you may not see directly that impact on cost, but that managing those transitions of care has the biggest impact for us in terms of cost reduction. And in, within our organization, we've seen our readmission rates go down, we've seen our hospital penalties go down, and it's a direct reflection of what our care coordinators do in the practices every day. And then staff support. You know, our staff um, think a lot differently now about having care coordinators in their practices 
because of the amount of, of help that they've gotten. And that's not just offloading work, it's education. You know, having an RN working with, uh, or an LPN working with an MA, and, and you all know MA's training is so variable, having an RN and an LPN there to help them as a resource is huge. Um, and, and it provides lots of um, confidence in our practices that we've got someone who they know they can go to. Our office managers go to our, to our uh, nurses um, on a regular basis and ask questions because they're, because they're accessible. They're not in the middle of, uh, of, you know, in the exam room all the time. Um, and, and, and a lot of times we have actually our care coordinators who take over for our office managers when our office managers can't be available. So everyone is seeing value. And that value is from top to bottom. Um, you know, demonstrated uh, across our organization because of this, and I think your organization needs to hear it. You need to tell it. So, so that transition um, that we are really, really trying to work on now, and, and this is a hard transition, is now moving from um, an organization that has accepted the, the concept of care coordination and team-based care um, to an organization that really wants to transition into a leadership model. I personally um, have pushed this, and I'm going to continue to push this across our organization, that the care coordinators own population health. They're empowered to take care of population health, and it's their job now to, to run that program. The providers can participate, um, and they need to participate. They need to be aware of what you're doing. They need to hear the stories. They need to hear um, the value you're creating. But, but they also um, now at a, are at a point where they're confident enough in the care coordinators that they'll relinquish that. Um, it took some time. The concept of, 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 of standing orders, for example, why would I allow my MA to order a mammogram, for God's sake? You know, now our mammograms get ordered by our MAs more often than they get ordered by us. Those are the kind of things that, um, that you know, that once we've built that value concept and we've shared with our organization, with our providers, the, all of the things that, that you all do, um, they're now willing to relinquish it. They have confidence that you all can do what you need to be doing. And now they're more willing to say, hey, listen, you take over all of it. Just let me go take care of patients, which is kind of what Mark's dad and grandfather have done. And so, so I think that's what I would really challenge you to think about. What are the things that you need to do as leaders to demonstrate that in your practices? So I always go back to what's your mission, what's your vision. Um, you, you have to understand the concept. What are you trying to accomplish? And, and I think, you know, it's very easy to say to provide the best quality of care we can provide for our patients. There's nothing wrong with that. Um, but maybe you have a different vision. You need to share that. You need to, you need to own that. And I think it's important from a leadership perspective that the people you work with hear that. Because when we walk through clinics and say, why are you here today? If they say it's because I get paid, I am really disappointed. It's because it's a mission. It's my calling. My calling is to take the best care of these patients and especially those, those most complex patients who, who you know, frustrate all of us. Um, but when that mission is there and people hear it, I think that, that shows them that you're a leader in that clinic. Don't wait for doctors to tell you what to do. Um, I think that's the most important thing. Visibility is important, um, and we, we, I think the providers in practice need to see you out there, but we need to see um, that, that you can take on a task and you can, you can own that task. Um, and so I, I would much rather have one of my care coordinators come to me and say, Dr. Gallus, here's what I'm going to do with this patient. How do you feel about that? Right. Um, but, but I don't expect to know the things that you know. Um, and so I think recognizing those competencies are different is really important. So when you walk into a practice, you know, don't expect to be the doctor. I mean, that's not what we want. I can tell you, I want you to have your own competencies. But, but when you're not sure about something, ask. And I think it's really, really good to say, Tell me, I don't understand why you would do this or why you would do that. I mean, th those are things that in the right setting are a great bonding uh, experience, or a great relationship building experience, because once someone sees you then follow that process and remember it, um, it tells you that, it tells them that you're willing to learn and vice versa. Teach, um, you know, when you, have, when you have people in practice and you're teaching them about um, that, that nutrition issue that Mark described. I had one the other day who was telling me about, he just couldn't understand why his blood sugars were running so high. He's cutting carbs out. I said, well, tell me what you had. He goes, well, I, I had two hamburgers and two hot dogs for lunch. Well, you know, he didn't have a lot of carbs, you know, uh, but I told him, I said, well, we, calories are important too. So, so those are the kind of things that, you know, um, I don't necessarily pay attention to, but you do. And that's going back and re-educating providers. If you ask me how many, how many carbs are in, uh, in, a, in a hot dog, I'm telling you, I have no idea. 
Um, those are the questions that I ask. So, so remember, we're all educating each other. I think be decisive. Um, you know, when 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 you have a provider who you're not sure about, um, and, or or you're not sure where to go, make the decision yourself. Um, there's nothing wrong with that. Um, you know, obviously none of us want to do harm, and we're not going to make decisions that are going to hurt someone. But I think if you know the right answer, um, then take it, take take advantage of that. I mean, what's someone going to do? Scold you because you made the right choice? And if you're not sure, ask. I mean, but but I think it's important to be decisive. If you're always asking the doctor, well, can I do this, can I do that, can I do this, I think you, you put yourself in that position where you're, you're now just one of the other members in, in, that, in that boat and he's in charge or she's in charge. Um, I think being decisive really puts you on a level playing field that's important. Um, be responsible. Um, you know, I think that's one of the things that we do see that becomes a little frustrating is that we juggle so many things. We start on one initiative and then we go to the next initiative and we don't finish, or we don't we don't follow up on something. I think the most important thing for me to build confidence and to see value is that if someone says they can, they're going to do this, they're going to do it, and they do it, and then they tell me they did it, because you need that feedback loop. And so, so if you make decisions and you're decisive, let people know what that what happened. You know, I mean, sometimes we can see it. We can see an A1C change, right? Or we can see a blood pressure change. But sometimes we can. It's behavior, and and I think those stories are important. But that also is part of the follow-up. Um, be passionate. Um, I think, you know, again, it goes back to mission. It goes back to calling. Um, when people understand that this is important to you for reasons beyond your paycheck, um, that, that storytelling, that sharing is important. And it, gives, it builds, again, builds value. Um, distractions. Um, I think this is one of the hardest things in a medical clinic. And if you've worked in practices for very long like I have, you can see that uh, you know a lot of times we're just we're, we're just a giant fire extinguisher and we're running from place to place spraying you know, uh, putting out fires. Um, you know, being focused on what our goals are is important, and and I, I think you have to be careful about having too many challenges. If you're trying to fix everything at once, you'll never fix anything. Um, and so so I think when you look at a practice, what is the goal of that practice? Each one's a little different. You know, when we look at our metrics, um, which practice is really struggling with immunizations? Let's put, let's put some resources around immunizations and make that our first goal. But that practice may do great with colon cancer screening. This practice may not. So, so I think picking three or four initiatives and really focusing on those initiatives is important. You know your practices and you know, begin that process of picking that initiative. What is it you really need to deal with? Um, and, and early in the process of building a population health program, you start with easy stuff, and as you move along, you look at more difficult stuff. So we're looking at things like heart failure and COPD. Those are really tough. Those are really challenging. But but that's because we felt like you could walk away from some of other initiatives because we really think we've got that part. So I think you have to think about prioritizing and focusing, and um, and not getting too lost in the the volumes of data that we have access to. Um, be a learner, and I think you know we are lifelong learners. Um, Sometimes I wonder when I go into practices and I see people doing things that, that we learned 15 years ago and they never changed. Um, and, and I think um, bringing stuff to your practice is important. Did you see this article on this? Have you read about this? I mean, I think when you're a constant learner, you want to share it with other people. So, so when you learn, share and, um, and, ed and be an educator. Um, being a team builder, and you know, I don't know if you've all have ever seen the validation uh, video. There's about a 20 minute video that's out there. And it's a great video, and it talks about the, the, the value of validating people. Um, and, um, and if you ever look at it, just, just, just um, Google a validation uh, video, and it, it's a really funny video. But, but I think when people do, good, do something well, compliment them. Tell them about it. Um, I think if you want to build a team, compliment your team members. They will, they will do anything for you. And I think that the more you do that, the more they see you as being the leader, and not just another person out there seeing patients. Um, and so, and that doesn't necessarily mean you have to validate the doctors, although it's nice to say, hey, listen, look at, look at what we did with this person. Not look what you did, but look what we did. But validating the people around them because they will be your best advocates um, as, as you begin to move into this, uh, into this program. And I think the other thing is being fun, um, being creative. You know, I look at some of the posters we have in our practices. We sometimes slip a little bit and kind of forget these things, but but uh, you know the more you enjoy it, the more you share that enjoyment, um, the more people see. Gosh, I, I want to be over there. I don't want to be over here. You know that 
that clinic hub is stressful, it's not fun, but in here, you guys are having, you're having a cookie party, or you're celebrating, or you're doing something um, that, that acknowledges what you've done. I think all of those are, are things that help build that team. <coughs> so share your successes. Um, you know, we, we talk a lot, um, we, storytelling is important. You know, when you have clinic meetings, and you have, uh, you have these kind of ability to, uh, to share, share, talk about your patients, all the things that you're doing, um, share the things that people do in your practice that, are, that you see and acknowledge. I think those are all really important keys to, to how you build this team and how you create value for the providers you're working with.